Uh, so the title of my talk is TB, an ancient disease, but a modern problem. And of course, it's cousins, the NTMs. I'm going to first review TB epidemiology, which many of you are very familiar with. Um, uh, TB has a world, it's is everywhere in the world. Um, it has a worldwide distribution and one third of the world's population is um, in, affected. TB is the top, in, we care about TB because it is the top infectious disease killer in the world. In 2017, um, it was responsible for 1.6 million deaths and it's a leading killer among people who live with HIV. Um, and even um, uh, is the is responsible for one in three AIDS related deaths. Uh, the majority of these patients are in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and there's been a worldwide increase um, that is worrisome of drug resistant TB, uh, especially in very populous and um, uh, populous countries such as India, China, Russia, and Eastern Europe. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on drug resistant TB because uh, we're going to just explore the basics. Uh, but I just wanted to, you to at least know the definition of what drug resistant TB should be. Um, multi drug resistant TB is um, when um, the, the, tubercul the tuberculosis is resistant to uh, both isoniazid and rifampin, which are two of the backbone um, drugs for TB treatment. Extensively drug resistant or XDRTB is the definition of MDR plus having resistance to any fluoroquinolone and at least one additional drug that's considered in the group A category. This includes the fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin and moxifloxacin, as well as bedaquiline and lin linazolid. Um, I wanted to first ask a question. Um, what is the risk of acquiring TB from a close contact who has a positive AFB smear? And, and you feel free to just chime in. You don't, it's okay to be wrong. Like just, or you can chat maybe if people can write in the chat, like a percentage. What is the percentage risk that you can acquire TB just by being a close contact? Um, the risk is, um, sorry, uh, when you are in close contact with a person who has a smear positive pulmonary TB, um, and that's when um, I think all of us have ordered AFB sputum cultures. Uh, there's two parts to it, the smear and the culture, and, the, and there's actually three parts, the gnat, the smear, and the culture. The smear is kind of, kind of like the quick stain, the acid fast stain. Um, so the smear could be positive or negative, but it's really the cultures that, um, that, that they see mycobacterial growth. Um, so in the smear positive, in a smear positive person who's diagnosed with pulmonary TB, your risk of acquiring TB from that person is 30%. And people can be diagnosed with pulmonary TB even if the smear is negative, because the smear could be negative, but the culture ends up growing something. And the risk of um, getting TB from a person um, that you're in close contact with is 10%. Um, I just wanted you to be familiar with the latent TB diagram, um, which is um, roughly what will happen um, when people are exposed and infected with tuberculosis. Um, first, after exposure, and that leads to infection, 10% um, of the time, um, people will have active tuberculosis. And among the, um, the people who do get active tuberculosis initially, 50% um, in those folks, it'll happen in the first two years of exposure, whereas um, the, the, the other 50% it'll reactivate later in their life. Um, so after exposure and infection, then the great majority of the time, people will develop latent tuberculosis. And, um, and this annual risk depends on whether they have HIV or not. So you always want to get an HIV test to screen them for HIV if you ever diagnose somebody with latent or active tuberculosis. Um, the, the risk of progression uh, from latent to reactivation TB um, is 5 to 10 percent, and that will be lifelong if the person is HIV negative. Um, and it's, and it's, or if you have HIV, it's a pretty rat, much more, you have much more progression from uh, latent to active. Um, it's actually five to 10% risk um, annually that accumulates. 
Um, there's two ways that we, um, two methods that we have developed to test for tuberculosis infection. Um, uh, I think you all are familiar with, um, with them. One is the PPD or the um, tuberculin skin test. Um, and the other one is the EGRA or the interferon gamma release assay. Um, when you diagnose somebody with TB infection, the chest x-ray can be normal, showing completely no scarring, or you can see a cavitary lesion. You might see granulomas or pleural parenchymal scarring. Um, when it comes to the PPD, um, the conversion of, uh, to a positive test really takes three to six weeks after an exposure. Um, and in people with HIV, um, their TB screening may not be very reliable. Both the EGRA and the uh, tuberculin skin test may be negative more than 10% of the time. And in the setting of people who live with advanced HIV with a CD4 count less than 50, um, and if there has been recent exposure to a person with active TB, you might wanna err on the side of caution and consider late in TB treatment, uh, even despite their negative screening tests. Um, this this um, table um, was a bane of my existence in med school and still is now because I it, you have to memorize it. Unfortunately, um, it is tested a lot on the boards. I think I think I remember a test in, a test question on either step one or step two. Um, I feel like this is a very common Q bank question as well. So um, the three categories that you can think of for PPDs, even though they're so much, they're just not commonly used as much as they used to be. Um, but um, I just kind of, in my, in my mind, I think of people who are extremely immune compromised. So you have to have a very high threshold for suspicion. So the cutoff is a lot lower, so you can capture more people. And that cutoff is five millimeters. And that's people with HIV, they're immune suppressed from transplant or they're on chronic steroids, they're on uh, biologic therapy, um, or their chest x-ray looks uh, uh, concerning for TB. So you, have a, you need to just have a really high threshold for suspicion. Um, and then with, um, and then I think we all feel, fall in the middle category because we are healthcare workers. And so I think of the middle category as, uh, so 10 millimeters for people with like a moderate risk because we're just exposed to people around us and people who go to dialysis centers, people who are IV drug users, people who work in prisons or, or they're incarcerated, uh, nursing homes, that kind of stuff. I, you can fit in the, in the, in the uh, medium category. And then the people who have no risk factors, um, you would put, they have the lowest level of suspicion. So they, you would want them to have, um, you don't suspect until the uh, diameter is 15 millimeters of um, in duration. Um, the EGRAs, there are two types of EGRAs in the United States. Uh, we use um, both the quantiferon and the T-spot. In the hospital setting, we are using the T-spot. And in the, in the outpatient setting, um, I've been ordering the quantiferon. EGRAs have excellent specificity, uh, greater than 90%, um, and they're supposed to be unaffected by previous BCG vaccination. Um, so I'll talk about very quickly how uh, they both work. Uh, the Quantiferon Gold Plus is uh, like a series of four test tubes, and um, you put your patient's blood in these test tubes. Um, it's an ELISA-based whole blood test that uses peptides from three TB antigens. And one of these is a mitogen positive control, one is a negative control, and, and the other contains TB antigens. Um, and the result is a, a quantification of um, the interferon gamma um, and in international units per mil. So it's looking at the amount of interferon gamma um, that's in your whole blood. Uh, the test is positive for MTB infection if the interferon gamma response to TB antigens is ab above the test cutoff and that you have to subtract the background noise in the uh, negative control. The T-spot um, works a little bit differently. I used to think they were basically the same thing, but um, it, it, T-spot is, um, instead of ELISA, it's slightly different. It's an enzyme-linked immunospot assay uh, performed on peripheral blood um, monocytes and lymphocytes. It uses um, slightly different uh, TB antigens. Um, it uses a, like a well plate. So um, those little circles are little wells in a plate that they use in the, in the laboratory. Uh, the result is the number of interferon gamma producing T cells. So it's looking at the number of T cells that produce interferon gamma. Um, and then they produce these purple spots. And then you're supposed to count all the spots. The test is positive for MTV infection at the 
spot counts in the TB antigen wells, the little circles, exceed a specific threshold relative to the control wells. Um, and unlike quantifier, the T-spot assay includes a borderline or indeterminate category. Um, so when it comes to the treatment of latent tuberculosis, the single most important thing to do before doing anything is to rule out active TB. Um, and this is you taking a good history, doing your physical exam, and getting a, a baseline chest x-ray. Um, the recent guidelines by the CDC and the National Tuberculosis Controllers Association, um, they released their guidelines in 2020. Um, I, back in med school, I feel like um, the traditional method was isoniazid plus um, vitamin B6 to prevent peripheral neuropathy for, for nine months. And that was um, the one that I remember uh, being taught in school. Um, but we now favor a rifamycin-based regimen because it can be a shorter therapy. Uh, rifamycin-based regimens, there are three, um, and um, some are more preferable than others. Um, first, you can give rifampin alone once a day for four months. And, that's, and after four months, um, they've completed their latent tuberculosis treatment. You can shorten it a little bit more to three months by combining two meds. You can combine the isoniazid plus rifampin both daily, uh, and then don't forget the vitamin B6, um, and then for three months, and then they will have completed their latent TB uh, treatment. Um, the lastly, it's isoniazid and rifapentin, which is a weekly dose, um, and that's for three months. That one, I think, um, it depends on the patient's preference, really, um, depending on whether you think that they'll be good at remembering a weekly dosing rather than a daily dosing, um, and also um, the fact that you'll get more side effects with two drugs as opposed to a single drug, like with just rifampin alone. Um, and then the, uh, the second one, this has become more second line, but isoniazid monotherapy for at least six months, but really nine months is preferable. Um, so isoniazid monotherapy for nine months is now uh, become more second line. Um, the effective treatment of latent tuberculosis will reduce the risk of progression of TB by 60 to 90%. Uh, so it's definitely worth getting people into, um, into um, ID clinic in order to complete their latent TB uh, treatment. Less than 60% of people will actually complete the nine-month isoniazid monotherapy, mostly because it's such a long duration of therapy, and people will get lost to follow up. Um, the shorter courses um, improve adherence, so that's why it's become more favorable. Um, and don't forget you need your baseline uh, LFTs to distinguish pre-existing abnormalities from um, side effects from the new drugs that you're starting. And isoniazid and rifampin, rifamycin, those, those predominantly have hepatotoxicity as, as its main side effect you want to discuss with your patients. You want to monitor people at least once a month with labs for um, and also to check in with them for clinical symptoms of hepatitis. Um, and just briefly, because um, all board exams uh, or all board exams love to at least include tests about pregnancy, uh, test questions about pregnancy. Um, during pregnancy, there is an increased risk of hepatotoxicity due to isoniazide um, uh, extending up to three months postpartum. So when when women when you are treating or thinking about treating a pregnant woman, you really have to. Um, consider and weigh the risks and benefits. You might want to actually reserve treatment um, if, because it's not emergent. You don't, it's not an emergency to start latent TB treatment now. Um, so you can reserve it for after they give birth and reserve treatment for those who are recently exposed to active TB or they're living with HIV or have other immune, significant immunosuppression um, to put them at great risk of developing reactivation TB. Um, I'm going to talk next about the clinical syndromes you get from TB. Um, this was a slide I remember seeing in my pathology lecture um, uh, with the KC8 in granulomas. Uh, TB most commonly involves the lungs, but it can affect any organ and can present like in any manner. Um, the characteristic histopathologic feature is uh, KC8 or cheese-like granulomatous inflammation. If there is parenchymal lung involvement, the patient is potentially contagious and you should put, put them in a negative pressure isolation room. Um, so this is, I'm talking about um, how to divide up clinical syndromes. They can be primary or reactivation um, disease, and they can be pulmonary versus extra pulmonary. 
Extrapulmonary TB is more common in people living with HIV and may present even without systemic, the obvious systemic symptoms, the ones that you're familiar with, like fevers, chills, night sweats, weight loss, coughing, and hemoptysis. The most common extrapulmonary site of involvement is the lymphatic system. Um, when it comes to pulmonary disease, we can uh, divide it up into primary TB and reactivation TB. Um, in primary TB, your symptoms may be really mild or even absent. Um, it's more likely to occur in children um, and more likely to be seen in endemic areas or people who are close contacts of people with infectious TB. You're going to see it in the mid, mid to lower lobe um, more than 80% of the time. Um, Hyler adenopathy is common and might be seen in two-thirds, uh, right greater than left, and pleural fusion is also common in up to 33% of patients. When it comes to reactivation TB, this is um, um, when, this is more common in adults and generally progressive. And then the symptoms of fevers and night sweats are very common. This is where the you see it in the apices of the lung, the upper lobe disease. Um, you'll you might commonly see cavitation and nodules. The extra pulmonary uh, syndromes are more common, and your CT findings. Um, the tree and bud sign, which is a very nonspecific term, but you might see that with hyalur adenopathy, nodules, um, and the tree and bud sign. TB pleuritis um, and pleural fusions. Um, pleural fusions can be seen in up to 25% of cases of primary TB. And although it may resolve spontaneously in a couple of months, it can leave behind some pleural thickening or calcifications. Um, you can make a presumptive diagnosis um, with um, the following criteria, uh, a lymphocytic predominant exudative effusion, so the, they, they will need a thoracentesis, um, plus uh, getting an ADA in the pleural fluid that's greater than 40, or you can um, see caseating granulomas on a pleural biopsy. AFB smear sensitivity is quite low in the pleural effusion. And NAT also has very low sensitivity in the pleural effusion, but it's about 50%. Uh, the definite, definitive diagnosis uh, of TB in the pleural, uh, pleuritis would be um, isolating the tuberculosis on a pleural fluid culture or a pleural fluid biopsy. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, two syndromes of pulmonary TB. You can have endobronchial TB, which is a diagnosis established by bronchoscopy. Um, and you, you would ask for brushings and lavage. They're high, very high yield for AFB cultures. Um, you might see bronchial stenosis. A bronchial ulceration is what causes the hemoptysis. And you might even see perforations um, that lead to fistulas. Um, people will have a barking productive cough, wheezing, ronchi, and rarely, rarely lithoptysis. Um, and a more a disseminated form of pulmonary TB is miliary TB, uh, which is spread through the bloodstream. It's seen in the first six months after TB exposure, but can occur in a reactivation disease. Um, acute miliary TB can be quite fulminant, affecting multiple organs, leading to septic shock and ARDS. Um, you're going to see this in the elderly, the very young, and the immunocompromised. And you should always see, almost always see lung involvement in miliary TB. The chest imaging might even show diffuse micronodules that are predominantly in the lower lobes and will look like millet seeds. And you should ask for a fendoscopy to rule out endophthalmitis. You're going to commonly see uh, cytopenias and anemia is the most common. And then high yield biopsy sites uh, when you're suspecting miliary TB include the bone marrow, liver, lymph nodes, and pleura. Uh, but you would probably aim for whichever is the safest or the most easily accessible. Um, extra pulmonary TB, um, I'm gonna next talk about, we just finished talking about pulmonary TB, so now we're gonna move on to extra pulmonary TB, which includes lymphadenitis. After the lung, the lymph node is the second most common site of involvement, usually due to reactivation disease. Um, the involvement of the cervical region is called scrofula, and uh, people could have chronic non-tender ad lymphadenopathy with or without fever. It can also be a bulky mass due to the conglomeration of lymph nodes. Um, you might want to be careful about recommending an IND because um, getting an incision and drainage can lead to formation of fistulas. Um, diagnosis will require tissue samples for AFB smear, culture, and histology, when they can um, acid fast stain for you as well in the histology. You might want to consider 
Find needle aspiration first, followed by a biopsy if needed, and, and that's a re reasonable approach. Um, CNS tuberculosis, um, there are three syndromes I'd like for you to know about. One is meningitis. Um, the other are, uh, I've never seen intracranial tuberculoma, uh, and, but that is a possibility, as well as spinal arachnoiditis. TB meningitis, um, the risk factors are people with severe immune, immune compromise, um, such as those with HIV or AIDS, um, immune suppression due to transplants, um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, um, and being advanced in age, um, being a heavy alcohol user, malnutrition, and cancer. Untreated, the outcome is a fatal within weeks. 50% uh, should have some chest x-ray abnormalities. Her CSF findings are going to be predictably with low glucose, high protein, and a lymphocytic uh, pleocytosis. And um, there's something that we call the expert. It's the MTB expert, which is the PCR for micro, um, and they use the probes to try to detect um, specifically MTB. And that um, that expert PCR can show greater than 70, 70, sorry 90% sensitivity and specificity for TB meningitis when you do in the CSF. Uh, TB endophthalmitis can involve any part of the eye, but usually presents as uveitis. It can be anterior or posterior due to uh, bloodstream spread. Clinical diagnosis, um, um, because if you're not able to get a tissue diagnosis, um, you can do a clinical diagnosis, and that's based on risk exposure, known TB disease elsewhere, um, or a positive test for TB infection in the typical findings of choroidal granulomas. You want to definitely rule out syphilis, sarcoid, and fungal infections that can mimic, uh, they can all look similar. Um, the definitive diagnosis is made by ocular tissue um, cultures that you send for AFB. Um, when it comes to bone and joint involvement, um, it, this is spread by um, hematogenous spread. It can affect any bone, and you might have heard of POTS disease, which is TB in the vertebrae, and it would causing discitis, osteomyelitis. It most commonly affects the lower thoracic and upper lumbar regions, and um, it might be associated with a cold um, psoas abscess. Ponset's disease is a, is a type of polyarthritis that can be seen in patients with active TB. It's acute and symmetric and immune-mediated. Um, when people have um, a bone and joint involvement uh, of TB, 50% will have pulmonary disease, and the diagnosis requires tissue samples for microscopy, culture, and histology, um, which you can get by needle aspiration and or biopsy. TB pericarditis um, is rare. It occurs in 1% of pulmonary TB cases. It will be relatively insidious, um, and you're going to have the presentation of someone maybe presenting with uh, newly developing heart failure with chest pains, orthopnea, cough. Um, there's four progressive stages. One, first, the fibrinous exudation uh, leading to serosanguinous, then granulomatous caseation, and then finally constrictive scarring and constrictive cardiomyopathy. Uh, the diagnosis requires, and this is a pretty invasive diagnosis, but a pericardiocentesis or biopsy. So you can do a presumptive diagnosis um, um, and uh, with a lymphocytic pericardial exudate, and you, you send for an ADA and it's greater than 30 IU per mil, per, per liter. Um, and then also, if they clinically respond to anti-TB therapy, then you know, then that can give you a presumptive diagnosis. And steroids are indicated only if there's a high risk of developing constrictive pericarditis or cardiomyopathy. Pericardiectomy may be required for uh, when uh, it becomes constrictive. BCG disease. Um, BCG is uh, actually uh, it's a vaccine um, where it's a live attenuated strain of M. bovis, and it's designed as a vaccine to protect babies from miliary TB and TB meningitis in very endemic countries. Uh, BG, BCG has no impact in preventing TB when you're an adult. Disseminated BCG infection can occur, and this will happen in people who have immune compromise. It's been used as an adjunctive immunotherapy in a bladder cancer uh, through direct bladder insulation since the 1970s. And um, 
So you can get BCG disease um, after getting intravesicular BCG treatment, um, and that can lead to all, all different types of TB syndromes. Um, BCG or M. bovis is inherently resistant to pyrazinamide, so therefore you actually treat them with a three-drug regimen of rifampin, isoniazid, and ethambutol. Um, so how do we make a TB uh, diagnosis? Um, all patients diagnosed with TB should get an HIV test first and foremost, and vice versa, people living with HIV, you should screen them for TB. And um, when it comes to using which screening test, it's gonna be institutionally de uh, de dependent, but for the most part, EGRAs are the preferred um, screening test for uh, latent tuberculosis in people who are two years old and above, um, and for uh, one-year-olds and babies, um, the TST is preferred. Um, the AFB or mycobacterial culture is the gold standard. Um, you have greater than 90% sensitivity for pulmonary TB, but it's less sensitive for extra pulmonary TB. Um, in the you actually, it takes so long for mycobacteria to grow. So we actually um, let it grow for up, for up to six weeks and maybe even longer. Um, if you ask the, the microbiology lab to, um, to wait until eight weeks, uh, liquid broth media allows for more rapid growth, um, such as six to 10 days. Um, so we, we make a diagnosis of TB um, by requesting three initial sputum cultures. These are AFB sputum cultures um, and try to get three of them in 24 hours. So they're separated by eight hours. Culture should be obtained um, monthly until negative on two consecutive months to determine total duration of therapy. This is once people are diagnosed, then you want to follow them up with cultures once a month uh, until they become negative. If people are not, people are considered not infectious. If you have three consecutive negative smears over at least two separate days after two weeks of therapy with clinical response. Um, and remember, AFB smear sensitivity is about 50 to 60 percent, and uh, it drops to 30 to 50 percent if they have advanced HIV. The NAT, the, it's the gene expert, um, uh, MTB-PCR, that it will detect MTB DNA. It's highly specific, but the sensitivity varies among different types of samples. Um, so I was talking about the expert that we use at, um, at, at our institution. Um, the test is run at Washington Hospital Center. Um, the expert MTB um, uh, RIFE test also detects uh, rifampin resistance and that will predict uh, MDR-TB. And then um, that's the name, and then the hologic amplified mycobacterium tuberculosis direct test is the other uh, PCR. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through the diagram of um, what to do uh, as you're, as you're uh, working up someone for tuberculosis. Um, so you're, you're, at, you're talking to your patient and they're telling you some signs and symptoms that make, start, are starting to make you suspicious for TB. Um, they're having a, a subacute duration of cough, fevers, a weight loss, and then they're with the uh, chest findings uh, that are abnormal and maybe you see a cavitary lesion in the right upper lobe. Um, you first get an HIV test um, and then you request, if they can produce sputum, you request three AFB sputum cultures uh, times three they're eight hours apart, and one of them should be an early morning sample. And you put them in a negative pressure isolation room. Um, then um, the AFB smear can result in a couple hours. The NAT testing will also take hours to a few days. And then the culture is what takes the longest of all. Um, in um, the, the lab will, will let it grow for up to six weeks. And then in order to interpret what's going on, looking at the bottom of the screen, um, you can have a smear. Smear is just the stain for acid fast. Um, the smear can be positive. And if the NAT is positive, the NAT is looking for MTB, then you know that it's TB for sure. Um, now, if it's smear positive, so it's some, you're seeing some acid fast staining uh, organism, but the NAT is negative, that's the MTB PCR is negative, then it's an acid fast staining organism that's not um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it could be an MTM. Um, so, and then smear is negative, but the NAT is positive, then that means that it just didn't pick it up on the stain, uh, but it might grow eventually on the culture, and the NAT is positive, so it gave you a quick result to allow you to diagnose TB more quickly than waiting for six weeks uh, for that culture to present something. And then smear, if you're smear negative, 
So it's not acid fasting staining anything. And then the NAT, the PCR is negative. Uh, then you consider it alternative diagnosis. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not mycobacteria. Um, in addition to AFB smears, NAT, and culture, samples should be sent for histologic examination because they can do the acid fast staining there as well and look at the morphology. Uh, test sensitivities in order of very highly sensitive to less sensitive is first culture, then uh, NAT. Uh, can pick up up to 100, 100 colony forming units per mil. And then AFB is the least sensitive, uh, requiring up to 10,000 colony forming units per mil. Um, I'm going to ask a question to the audience. I think um, many, many of you will know this answer. What isolation precautions do you use when you suspect TB? Okay, so I'm just going to look at the chat and see if there's any answers. Oh, I might, I might try to answer the questions at the end. Sorry, just notice the questions. Oh, did I hear someone say, say something? Airborne. Airborne. Um, so what, what is airborne precautions and, and why? Um, airborne transmission occurs because um, these airborne droplets are disseminated um, over time and long distance. Um, this includes the spores of aspergillus and um, also N N MT MTB. Um, so these particles can be dispersed over long distances by air currents and may be inhaled by susceptible people who, who, who even if they have not had a face-to-face -face with the infectious person or they're not even in the same room. Um, preventing the spread requires a use of special air handling and ventilation to contain and then safely remove um, the tuberculosis uh, particles. And so you put them in a negative pressure isolation room or another name for it is airborne infection isolation room, um, which recycles the air in the room about uh, six to 12 times uh, an hour. Um, and then examples for, for when you wanna put people on airborne, some examples are MTB, measles and disseminated VZV. Um, does anybody know the criteria to remove TB isolation or airborne? And this more than one answer can be right. All of them. All of them. Well, th close, three of them. You can have negative um, AFP sputum cultures. Um, three of them by themselves, or if you have at least two gnats that come back negative, you can remove airborne. And then, or if you're pretty sure it's an alternative diagnosis that explains all of your patient symptoms and it's not uh, TB. Um, and then uh, it doesn't matter about what the chest x-ray shows. Um, but overall, um, overall, it's um, your clinical judgment though, um, to rule out infectious TB. It's um, if the testing is not perfect, sputum AFB smears can be insensitive, especially when uh, in our country with low TB prevalence, uh, because patients will tend to present earlier in the course of their illness. And um, the, the PCR, the expert essay, will detect 95 to 100% of AFB smear positive cases, but it's less sensitive at picking up when it's smear negative, but culture positive cases of pulmonary TB. So your clinical judgment remains really the essential part of this decision, even with negative PCR tests. Um, so I'm gonna uh, uh, say a case out loud, uh, and then we'll do some questions. Uh, this is a 45-year-old uh, female healthcare worker uh, who was originally from the Philippines, uh, but lived in the US, US for uh, 20 years. Um, and she presented with three weeks of this cough, night sweats, and weight loss. She, um, she does go back to the Philippines very often uh, to visit family. Her T-spot is positive. Um, her HIV screen is negative. Um, and oh, if you're wondering why um, a healthcare worker, her T-spot wasn't picked up, um, maybe she had always done PPDs um, all the previous times and then her healthcare center decided to switch to a T-spot. And then her uh, chest X-ray shows a cavitary lesion in the right upper lobe with hyalur adenopathy. Um, two out of three AFB sputum cultures show smear positive and a NAT, NAT positive. Um, you diagnose the patient with pulmonary TB. What treatment would you start and for how long would you want to treat her? <laughs> 
And you guys might be familiar with the RIPE therapy. It's uh, the four drugs um, that spells RIPE, rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Um, for drug susceptible TB, uh, the duration can be between six to nine months. Um, and um, you have an initial phase and the con continue, uh, well, maintenance phase. Um, the initiation phase would be the first two months of therapy and then the remain remaining four months uh, for a total of six months would be maintenance therapy. Um, you want to have a more longer duration of therapy in certain cases. Um, the following, um, uh, including the following, which is CNS disease, um, you're going to want probably uh, closer to nine to 12 months of therapy uh, when it's very severe pulmonary disease and there's cavitation, persistent positive cultures after two months of therapy. Um, you want to give them at least nine months. HIV not on ART, um, you should treat for at least nine months. And when people have bone and joint disease, um, 12 months is favored, especially in the setting of hardware. Um, just very quickly for active TB treatment, the six versus nine months um, was determined uh, based on a randomized trial in, uh, published in 1990. It, comp it compares six months of therapy compared to nine months. Uh, with six months of therapy, it was isoniazid plus rifampin plus pyrazinamide for the first two months, and then isoniazid plus rifampin for the remaining uh, remainder of the six months. And nine months, uh, the nine months regimen was just isoniazid plus rifampin. Um, compared to the nine month regimen, patients on the six month regimen converted more rapidly, had similar rates of adverse drug drug reactions, uh, were less likely to be non-compliant, and had similar relapse rates. Uh, two years after completing therapy. So, and a significantly, the most important part of this is a significantly greater portion of patients assigned to the six month regimen successfully completed therapy. And that's what's really the most important part. Uh, you want your patients to complete therapy. So if a shorter, shorter course is gonna get them there, then that's preferable. Um, and this is just um, a table summary saying, saying pretty much the same thing, which is the intensive phase or the initial phase is the first two months uh, with the, the RIPE therapy. Um, a daily dosing is preferable to intermittent dosing. Um, and then the continu continuation or uh, maintenance phase is the remaining or, remainder of the six months. Um, I think when people, they, they mentioned directly observed therapy, and that's really where you need your um, Department of Health to be involved. And they do um, um, I've seen them do uh, like video, like I think with nowadays with video being a lot easier, they can, they do like video check-ins to make sure that they, they, they watch their patients, like take the medicine in front of them on the video. Um, so, so for follow-up after treatment of TB, uh, or at least the start of uh, therapy, um, after two weeks of therapy, you want to obtain weekly sputum smears until the patient is smear negative. Once a negative sputum smear is first documented, uh, you want to obtain two additional sputa on separate days to confirm that the patient is non-infectious. Uh, you want to do monthly sputum culture until you have two consecutive cultures that are negative. And then um, when people are on treatment, monthly clinical evaluation, including um, a color discrimination test, especially if they're on ethambutol, um, until they complete um, therapy. Um, what do you do when the smear is still positive two weeks after ripe therapy? Um, so my next slide uh, says treatment failure, but that's not I, what I meant to get at is um, when someone is smear positive two weeks after starting ripe therapy, um, the smears can stay positive. Like you might have dead organisms that are staining um, the acid fast, uh, but it's really about the growth on the plate because that's representative of living organisms. So uh, someone could still have positive smears two weeks after ripe therapy, but um, it's really the culture that will help you determine whether someone has failed. Um, the t so TB treatment failure is defined as having positive cultures, not the smear, but the cultures showing designating living organisms after four months of therapy. Um, and people might, might tell you of symptoms that make you suspicious of failure, like their symptoms aren't getting better. Um, or, um, and then it can be due to a lot of different things. Like if you fail treatment, it might be a lack of adherence, or it could be something that's outside of their control, like malabsorption, um, or a drug resistance, or that they have such extensive disease. And TB relapse is defined as having recurrent TB after completion of treatment and apparent cure. Um, uh, people, you, there's a caveat for people with HIV. 
people, um, in people living with advanced HIV and they have TB, uh, immune reconstitution syndrome can occur after starting ART. Um, and in iris is, um, iris for TB is a paradoxical worsening of TB symptoms, um, or it can mean uh, unmasking of unknown TB disease when people start their ART. And iris usually appears um, within two to three weeks after starting ART and may require treatment with corticosteroids. But it's important to continue both TB treatment and ART. And so when would you give adjunctive corticosteroids um, in addition to TB treatment? Um, if, some, if someone has HIV and they're baseline low, and they have baseline low CD4, less than 100, and they're starting ART within 30 days of starting TB treatment, um, we favor giving them steroids. Um, this would be 40 milligrams daily for two weeks, followed by 20 daily for two weeks um, during the first one month after starting ART. And that's in order to try to reduce the likelihood of iris. You also give steroids with TB meningitis and uh, TB pericarditis um, in order to reduce the risk of constriction. Um, we're probably not gonna spend much time on NTMs, uh, but uh, NTMs um, stand for non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, they're very, they're ubiquitous organisms um, everywhere around you in the soil and water. Um, these are probably, I don't think I really knew NTMs apart from MAC, and um, I knew M. Chalone because I rotated at the NIH as a third year resident, but these names like Kanzensii, Zenopi, Simie, um, they're, um, I don't expect you to be familiar with them. They're just, there are many, many species, and um, um, some, I'm gonna tell you which ones are maybe important for you to know now. Um, uh, I don't expect them to be really that testable on the boards. Um, the, NTMs, um, they're important for you to think when um, you need to just keep your differential broad. Um, we divide NTMs based on their rate of growth, and they, that can actually help you with diagnosis as well and empiric treatment. Um, so NTMs can be rapidly growing or they can be um, slowly growing. So rapidly growing organisms, um, they usually grow um, and uh, start growing and showing you something on the plate within seven days, and whereas everything else will grow like at six weeks. Um, so rapidly growing mycobacteria or RGMs, I don't want you to memorize this or anything, but I just want to point out RGMs, um, I think of, um, there's no real good acronym, but I just think of um, CFAM, which is Chelonie, uh, Fortuitum, Obsessus, and Mucogenicum. And then the, you just have to memorize the RGMs and then everything else is a slowly growing mycobacteria. Um, under pulmonary NTM, um, the risk factors for NTM um, in the lungs are people with underlying chronic lung disease and smokers. Um, when uh, risk factors for disseminated disease are people with um, some, some problem in their immune system that could be genetic, they have a genetic syndrome with, that alters their um, pathways for interferon gamma or IL-12, or they have cell-mediated immunodeficiencies such as um, um, HIV and, and iatrogenic like steroid use. The risks of TNF alpha blockers is unclear. Um, and depending on the clinical presentation, the clinical syndromes might be associated with different types of NTM. Like as an example, when you have lymphadenitis and it's due to a, a type of mycobacteria that is not TB, then it's most likely to be MAC. Um, pulmonary infections are gonna be caused by MAC, M. cansensii, and abscesses. And in disseminated infection, um, in people who have HIV, um, MAC, and M. cansensii, you wanna think about. And in people without HIV, a disseminated NTM most commonly can be abscesses or chelonia, uh, which can be very aggressive. Um, I think the important part to make about NTMs is that um, um, it's how to diagnose it because just the presence of something growing in an acid fast culture uh, does not necessarily mean that they truly have NTM disease because you might just pick it up um, because they're ubiquitous. Um, they're ubiquitous and their isolation culture by itself is not sufficient to make a diagnosis of clinical disease. Um, more than one positive sputum culture is recommended for diagnostics. And um, you should also be able to isolate the same NTM species in two or more sputum cultures collected over an interval of one, one week or more. 
and NTM diagnosis requires compatible clinical presentation in addition to the identified organism. Um, so in order to diagnose NTM pulmonary disease, you need to meet three criteria, the clinical syndromes like the patient's symptoms, um, microbiology, and, and the chest x-ray or CT. Um, if diagnosis is not confirmed based on all three criteria, um, you should follow the patient until diagnosis is either confirmed or excluded. Um, and this is just reiterating, this is the 2020 ATS and IDSA guidelines for NTM pulmonary disease, which is basically saying that you sh there's clinical, um, you have to meet clinical, microbiology, and radiographic criteria in order to um, uh, diagnose your patient with NTM pulmonary disease and to talk to them about possible treatment. Um, I'm going to talk about MAC and then I'll stop after that. But um, MAC is the most common cause of pulmonary disease, followed by M. cancensii and abscesses. Um, significantly, um, um, MAC disease in the lungs is unlikely in patients who have just a single sputum culture, but it can be as high as 98% who have at least two positive cultures. And uh, again, I'm reiterating, just because a patient meets diagnostic criteria for NTM pulmonary disease, it does not mean that you need to start them on NTM treatment. Um, the big picture assessment of the, you need to do a big picture assessment of whether, of how pathogenic the NTM is, the patient's symptoms and how it's affecting their quality of life, uh, the risks and benefits of therapy, the patient's wish and ability to receive treatment, as well as the goals of therapy should be discussed. Um, and that's because NTM treatment can be very, very long, like months, and with multiple drugs, uh, which all come with side effects. In some cases, watchful waiting may be the preferred course of action. So MAC is um, a clinically important NTM um, that I'd like for you to know about. It's um, the most common cause of NTM disease in the US. The two major species are avium and intracellulary. Um, intracellulary is the most common cause of NTM lung disease, and avium is the most common cause of disseminated NTM in AIDS patients. You might see two presentations. First is called the apical fibrocavitary lung disease, and it's a more aggressive form uh, that affects men uh, at around um, ages 40 to 50, associated with tobacco use and excessive alcohol use, and if left untreated, can progress in a few years to extensive lung cavitation and respiratory failure. The other syndrome for MAC you might have heard of before as Lady Windermere syndrome. Um, it's also called nodular bronchiectatic disease. Um, will affecting um, postmenopausal non-smoking white women. Um, it's a slowly progressive form of um, the illness. There's um, frequently it affects the right middle lobe or the lingula. To treat MAC lung disease, um, you want to get, get macrolide sensitivity testing, um, and the standard regimen is a combination therapy with rifampin plus ethambutol and a macrolide like azithromycin or clarithromycin. Um, when it comes to um, the more, um, the Lady Windermere syndrome, you can get away with three times a week dosing as opposed to the more aggressive disease where you need daily dosing. And duration can be 12 months after achieving culture negativity. So this is a long treatment course. And in refractory cases, um, you'll have to start considering things like IV aminoglycosides and surgical resection. So it's a big deal to, to consider treatment. Um, MAC disseminate disease, um, you'll see fevers, you'll see disseminated, um, disseminated symptoms like abdominal tenderness, hepatospinomegaly, and lymphadenopathy. You'll see this in people with AIDS and a CD4 count less than 50. And um, you wanna get culture of MAC isolated from a sterile site. And AFB blood cultures can be positive or very sensitive in picking this up. Um, and if you get the second AFB blood culture, that will increase the sensitivity to 98%. And then uh, you can also diagnose by taking a biopsy of the bone marrow, lymph node, or liver. And then MAC will also cause lymphadenitis, and it's the most common cause of mycobacterial lymphadenitis in the US. It happens more often in children. The cervical glands are affected. Um, you want to exclude TB, and surgical resection alone can result in a cure. Um, but you might have persistent disease because of sinus tract formation and chronic drainage. Uh, so you want to be careful. Uh, to avoid the use of TB drugs without, without also making sure a macrolide is part of that regimen and to avoid um, an incision without excision.
And that can also cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and it's called the hot tub lung. Um, this lung disease is associated with MAC exposure caused by ex going to an undrained pool or a spa that has overgrowth of MAC. MAC can be resistant to the disinfectants that are used in pools. The treatment is controversial, but usually consists of removing the source um, and uh, plus or minus steroids and a short course of antimicrobial therapy, like three to six months, depending on clinical response and disease severity. Um, I'm just gonna, um, I know we're, Pretty much we're out of time, but um, I just want to point out in cardiac surgery, there's been an NTM associated with um, the heater cooler system and the cardiac surgeries, and that's M Chimera. I don't think M Chimera will be tested, like you'll, you won't be tested on the medicine boards for M Chimera. And um, this last case I was going to present, it was a, a woman with breast cancer um, I saw at, at, at Georgetown uh, who had um, a metaport inserted for her chemo and the metaport just has always been bothering her the entire time since insertion. She just always had pain and then it just progressively worsened over months. Um, so over three months. And so this was like kind of low, slow and insolent. And um, eventually IR removed the metaport. They, they took, they sent off for cultures, including luckily AFB and uh, they debrided the pocket. It was purulent. Um, we uh, noted that she improved a little bit when someone gave her boxyfloxacin as an outpatient. Um, and this turned out to be, um, the, the key point was that her AFB blood cultures um, grew after four days of growth. So that was a rapidly growing NTM. And so this question was just uh, simply to di differentiate between uh, a rapidly grower, a rapid grower versus the, the slower growers. And um, so that's M. Chelonia here.